Hey, you own a business? Maybe we should consider advertising on the show. See if we can make a little bit of money. My email address is scott at scotthorton.org. All right, y'all, welcome back. I'm Scott Horton. It's my show, The Scott Horton Show. Hey, guess what? For the first time in way too long, I got Marcy Wheeler on the line. Empty Wheel is what they call her on the internet. Emptywheel.net is the website. It's not just her. There's a couple other guys. So one of them's really good on other legality stuff, and then the other guy's really good on Iran issues. And it's a great little blog there, man. Emptywheel.net. Uh, hi, Marcy. How are you? It has been too long, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Uh, very happy to hear your voice again. Uh, so tell me about uh, this thing. What uh, I guess just came out today here on your site, how to make peaceful protesters of America's torture school look like terrorists. So uh, first of all, which torture school? Because there are a couple of different ones. (laughs) It's hard to keep these straight. I was talking about School of the Americas down in Fort Benning. Um, Ah, For about 20 some years, there have been people who go and protest it because uh, Latin Americans who get trained there go on to murder priests and torture their dissidents. And so uh, lots of really honorable Americans want to shut the thing down. Yeah. And this really has been a controversy. And really, it's protesting. It is a tradition, right? You get Martin Sheen and all these people come out every year. They have for 20 years or something, right? Right. This should be a no-brainer. I mean, let's shut the thing down and stop exporting our bad You're habits. a terrorist. You are a terrorist for <laughs> saying that our school, our government school where they train terrorists, uh, should be shut down. That's what the FBI is saying? So what they, they opened an investigation in 2000, and they basically said, you know, this thing won't go away, so let's call them, let's, let's investigate them. But they opened up the investigation in counterterrorism preparedness. So... It's not an, it's not a terrorism investigation like some of the codes that showed up on anti-wars uh, FBI file, but it is mm-hmm. related to terrorism, um, which is something else you, we can go back to. But, but, uh, and, but what they did, um, cause normally what they were doing is they would just go out and they'd hang out with the, um, with the local cops and the local cops would take care of it and they would hide all of these military police behind Behind the walls. So in case anything bad happened, then this swarm of MPs would come out and and they would, you know, take down the the nuns and priests who are protesting the torture school. Um, But what happened, what the file shows, in addition to the arrest records of a lot of people, and they kept kind of increasing the punishment of the people who would deliberately get arrested as as part of civil disobedience there, um, is that recurrently they found things to invoke to say this is a ter- this is a potential terrorist event and kind of ratchet up the pressure. So um, one of the ones I'm most interested in is in 2003, they said, golly, we have completely unsubstantiated rumors that uh, anarchists from the anti-free trade of America's protest might come to Fort Benning, Georgia and protest with um, with these priests and nuns and other peaceniks. And uh, and that was their excuse that year to kind of ratchet up the pressure there in 2009 and eight. uh, Remember, there was an investigation of a bunch of people in Minnesota and Chicago and actually one in Grand Rapids um, who had ties to Palestinians, among others, and also um, some socialists, some FARC people in, in Colombia, but not terrorists. And they were investigated for a long time. And and the group had ID'd the um, FBI, one of the, the two FBI informants who had been hanging out for years with them. Um, and and those informants were present in 2009, at least. And that was the excuse for the FBI to be there. And so it's stuff like that. I mean, it's it's it, it, it's a testament to the fact that in any large grouping of people uh, exercising the First Amendment rights, uh, whether it's Black Lives Matter, who, by the way, um, Oregon is surveilling their tweets. Their, or, Oregon is surveilling the tweets of people who use the hashtag Black Lives Matter and live in Oregon. So they're being surveilled. Um, but when groups of them t- come together, as we saw in in um, Ferguson and in Baltimore, the 
the FBI find some reason to invoke terrorism and then start flying surveillance planes overhead. And so it seems like we're to the point where any time a group gets together, they can say, oh, terrorism, let's get out the informants. Oh, terrorism, let's get out the stingrays. Oh, terrorism, let's bring out the planes. And mm-hmm. so that's what happens. The stingrays, right. That's another one. That's where the cops in a plane or, or with their own tower uh, preempt and, and mimic the local cell phone towers and grab all of our information and even listen to us, right? Right. Yeah, that's a big one. So now... Um, yeah, so this is a very important thing, like you're saying. When it, It's not just, oh, boo-hoo, they call me some name. It means that they get to lower the threshold for, uh, quote-unquote, legitimate or lawful action against you, whether it's but, at the protest or investigating you, maybe in trying to intimidate you and chill your speech in the first place, these kinds of things. Yeah, although this protest has gone on so long, they're really good at, at I mean, A, they're peaceful, and, and the local people know they're peaceful, and for the most part, they get along. I mean, I think it was pretty touchy in 2003 because it became an Iraq protest, 2003, 2004. Mm-hmm. But, but, you know, they're there, they're there every year, and so every year uh, for this 10-year period, they were basically going, here's what goes on, and here's the school we're going to use to deploy from, and don't use this apartment complex anymore. Use this apartment complex. Um, so, it, you know, it became kind of a process. Um, I think in 2006 or so, the um, protesters got the 11th Circuit to say they couldn't use hand wands anymore to search for weapons. Um, you know, so it's it's an institution. It's been there forever. And it's just a matter. And, and also to the FBI's credit, they, they did uh, at times repeat warnings that they're not supposed to be surveilling First Amendment activities, although... You know, they would stop cars and they for a while were wanding people and so on. Um, but it, but but again, even for something that is a yearly event that has a long, long history of being peaceful, it took until 2009. And, and I, I need to go back and read the FBI's investigations guidelines, because in 2009, they're like, well, per the DIOG, per the FBI investigations guideline, uh, it's time to shut this down. And so they they. They finally did in 2009, but it took them, you know, 10 years of an active investigation every year they came in and 10 years. I mean, I guess the thing that most concerns me is they would occasionally put the word out to to Miami for the FTAA thing. And I think pretty much everyone in the country was doing that. Um, but, to you know, let's call up Pittsburgh. There was a guy in Pittsburgh who got busted for some crime and let's get all the evidence there. And it's this notion that you're going to, to, to do a network analysis of these protesters. Um, or they would get, there were two years where they would get an informant who would say, here's a nun that you should definitely look out for because, you know, everyone knows nuns are dangerous. Um, it, it's that kind of thing that is just, um, it's, it's just really unfortunate and stupid. Yeah, well, and, um, you know, when you call somebody a terror, when a government agent calls somebody a terrorist, then, um, you know, they could go much further than this if it comes down to it. And I guess, you know, that's the most important point of all of this is the one you made about the way the government considers any organized political action that takes place outside of the two parties. You want to participate in politics? There's your two parties. You have so much as a protest on the street. And, whoa, hey, what are you doing trying to terrorize us into changing our policies? Oh, my God. And... You know, they even, it's almost like South Park or something, where they convince themselves of this nonsense. That a bunch of hippies and, uh, and Hollywood actresses and stuff are, uh, well, I don't know how much they really convince themselves. Seems like they do a bit, and, and if they can deploy these kind of powers, it, it could lead to the situation where, as they already have it written in the law, right, Marcy, that they could put us in, military prison or in Guantanamo Bay or something under the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012 and everyone since then. Well, it's um, a bad precedent. Um, you know, I think that I think I'm I'm more worried about what local cops are going to do because they're more likely to kill you sooner. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and there, there's a lot less visibility on what they do. And I mean, but that's sort of the thing is that you've got this Cootie's theory of policing, which says if anybody has any tie to something we consider terroristic, whether mm-hmm. it's anarchists or 
uh, people who work with Palestinians right. or what have you, then the entire larger group becomes tainted. Right. And, Two and, and three hops and all that. All right. Hold and it right then there. You get to have a, uh, a law enforcement presence where you otherwise shouldn't have it. Right. Hang on one sec. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here for Liberty.me, the great libertarian social network. They've got all the social media bells and whistles. Plus, you get your own publishing site, and there are classes, shows, books, and resources of all kinds. And I host two shows on Liberty.me. I on the Empire with Liberty.me's Chief Liberty Officer Jeffrey Tucker every other Tuesday, and The Future of Freedom with FFF founder and president Jacob Hornberger every Thursday night, both at 8 Eastern. When you sign up, add me as a friend on there, scotthorton.liberty.me. Be free. Liberty.me. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here for MPV Engineering. This isn't for all of you, but for high-end contractors specializing in industrial construction and end users who own and operate industrial equipment, MPV offers licensed professional consulting on chemical and mechanical engineering for your projects. Tanks, pressure vessels, piping, heat exchangers, HVAC equipment, chemical reactors for oil companies or manufacturing facilities, as well as project management support and troubleshooting for those implementing designs. MPV will get your industrial project up and running. Head over to mpvengineering.com. All right, you guys. Welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. It's my show, Scott Horton Show, and I'm talking with Marcy Wheeler. She writes at EmptyWheel.net. I hope you're reading. And, uh, well, we're talking about uh, the FBI going out of bounds in their investigations of peaceful protesters at the School of the Americas torture school there. And where we left off, we were talking about, uh, you said you're more afraid of the local cops than the feds at this point because they, I guess, have incorporated this same federal um, kind of conspiracy theory by computer form of policing, the cooties theory of policing, I think you call it, where the computer says that this number has an association with this number, this number, blah, blah, blah. We're talking about only data on a page, no knowledge whatsoever by the cops about what they're looking at or what any of these relations mean, except they can use their imaginations to fill in the gaps to mean whatever they want. And, and of course, they always err on the side against our rights and for their power. And then I guess you were saying, too, that the locals are far less transparent and accountable when it comes to how they implement these kinds of procedures and rules and technologies. Yeah, I mean, that's the point is when you're sharing all this information and local cops are going to be privy to it, um, you know, I don't, I don't trust the DEA at all. I trust the FBI somewhat more only because it's 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 got a better le- level of accountability. But, you know, you've got however many different jurisdictions and lower training levels and um, local tensions. And I think that, you know, so when you're giving this mandate and saying, oh, there's terrorists out there, I think that's where it's really likely to be abused, be, it, to be especially abused. And, and this is, you know. If you're Muslim, it's going to be abused. I guarantee it. If if you are Latino and they think you have ties to the drug war, it's going to be abused. I guarantee. You know, um, but just generally, if you are somebody who's a peace protester or somebody who, you know, Occupy Wall Street or what have you, I just think it's it's um, it is it's in that process where things get shared with localities, you know, and even the big ones like New York. NYPD is one of the worst. Um, and they were during the Occupy Wall Street protests finding one person who, uh, a, a Muslim who changed his name and therefore, according to the NYPD rules, was a suspect for terrorism. And then he had cooties and then the rest of Occupy Wall Street had cooties. And I, and I think that's the kind of thing that happens far too often. Mm-hmm. And then it's nobody's fault because, hey, it was the computer said. So, it's really hard yeah, to hold you know, anybody you accountable. Sure you got to for... connect the dots. You got to, you know, it, it's this, it's this chainiest notion where you've got to do everything you can to defend against having something happen, and and very little uh, concern about what the presence of the cops does and how, you know, and and how it changes and makes it more likely there will be violence and so on and so forth. Yeah. And again, it's all data and ignorance, no real knowledge. And Gareth Porter has shown for years and years back in 2011, he did a award-winning report about Afghanistan 
And this is how McChrystal and Petraeus would target all the people that they'd kill in their drone strikes and their night raids and whatever. And it was all just based on this phone number was associated with this phone number was associated with this phone number. And it was a total failure. All they did basically was kill innocent people. And then I right. guess the Snowden documents and intercept reporting later confirmed all of that. that right. They're more than happy to pretend that they have perfect knowledge when, in fact, they have the barest of information. Well, it's they, they haven't tested this two degrees of cooties theory. Um, and they haven't, I mean, one of my favorite, not favorite, it was a horrible example, but, uh, there was, there was a targeted killing in, in Yemen that got, um, that it happened to have some, uh, stringers for American press outlets. So therefore people who were immediately, you know, had an outlet here in the States, we're like, this is exactly who this guy was. Yeah. Did he talk to Al Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula? Yeah. Did, was he considered a member of our community? Yeah. Is he the person that we would go to if we ever wanted to establish some kind of peace and, and, and get beyond war? Absolutely. And those are the people who get killed because those are the people who um, are considered the 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 net, the key people in the network, right? You know, if, if they're the ones that are uh the the nexus between people who talk with al qaeda and people who are considered upstanding citizens they're the ones who are going to look really interesting in a in a network analysis and so therefore they're the, they're going to be the ones who get the drone yep great example and i bet it could go wrong a, a hundred other ways but that is a perfect example of how wrong it can go. All right, now, I'm sorry, uh, in the last few minutes here, can you talk to me a little bit about, I heard that one of the courts said, hey, stop collecting all the Americans' phone data, NSA, which, didn't they already have to do that? Because, uh, oh, no, I guess not. Uh, but then another court said, nah, forget it, go ahead. So for three more weeks, the old dragnet is still operational until uh, basically midnight, uh, twenty uh, dis- November 28 to 29. And that's when we switch from patriot to freedom. It, <laughs> ouch. Oh, Scott, don't. <laughs> that was horrible. Um, yeah, I guess that's what they want us to think. Um, and, uh, and so there have been two main court decisions. One is a circuit court, the Second Circuit, which is New York, basically said this program doesn't abide by the law. Here's what the law says you can do, and you guys have gone so far beyond the law that uh, it's just not right. Now, they ruled that last year or this year, uh, right before USA Freedom Act passed, and um, and kind of kept their hands off the constitutional question. And then the ACLU came back and said, uh, could you also tell us whether it's unconstitutional? And they said, no, we don't really feel like doing that. So in that in, – in New York, it is – that program is illegal, although it's legal until the 29th. Um, because of the way the court decided it. Uh, but the court hasn't decided whether it's unconstitutional or not. In the D.C. District, which is the lower court level, the first level of court, a uh, judge by the name of Richard Leon uh, way back in December of 2013 said, whoa, this is unconstitutional. And that got appealed up to the D.C. Circuit, and they said, we don't think these people have standing, which is the, you know, which is the way everything gets punted on surveillance issues. It was kind of a dumb decision, but that's what they said. And mm-hmm. they're, you know, they're circuit judges and I'm not. So they punted it back to Leon to say, is there anything more to do with this? And Leon said to the plaintiffs, one of whom is Larry Clayman, um, they said, go get somebody who has unquestioned standing. So go get somebody from a different phone company who, who works with a different phone company. So he did that. And Leon said was it last week, uh, for this one person, J.J. Little, who's a lawyer in California, um, I enjoin, I'm going to stop the dragnet. They can no longer collect your phone records. And the government was sort of like, yeah, buzz off. Um, I mean, they, they, were, they were very contemptuous. Um, but, the, you know, the net effect is a day later they got the D.C. Circuit to issue an uh, emergency stay. There's going to be briefing on Friday and Monday, and we'll see whether J.J. Little, one lawyer in California, gets to have his phone records uh, protected, <laughs> um, which the government says is going to shut down the entire dragnet. And, and the, you know, they're engaging in such bad faith at this point that I just wish judges would make fun of them. 
but but judges aren't going to make fun of them on the technical issues. But you know, it's it's just nonsensical. It's what they're saying is 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 largely nonsensical. But they're saying that so as to say, oh my gosh, if you protect JJ Little, then everyone else in the United States will go unprotected, and therefore you can't make us protect JJ Little. So that, that's kind of what the government is arguing. Um, not all that convincingly to me, but then you know I know a lot about this dragnet, and these judges don't. Yeah. I wish you were the judge. That'd be better. All that it stuff would, would have been struck down a long time ago. I know, and then I'd also strike down all laws with with uh, euphemistic Orwellian names like freedom and and patriot. Yeah. As a general rule, that should be a constitutional <laughs> amendment against those. All right. Hey, thanks, Marcy, very much. You're the best. All right. Take care. All right, so that is the great Marcy Wheeler. She writes at EmptyWheel.net, EmptyWheel.net, and uh, boy, she's good on all of this surveillance stuff, especially. You hate government, one of them libertarian types, or maybe you just can't stand the president, gun grabbers, or warmongers. Me too. That's why I invented LibertyStickers.com. Well, Rick owns it now, and I didn't make up all of them, but still, if you're driving around and want to tell everyone else how wrong their politics are, there's only one place to go. LibertyStickers.com has got your bumper covered. Left, right, libertarian, empire, police, state, founders, quote, central banking. Yes, bumper stickers about central banking. Lots of them. And, well, everything that matters. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. Hey, y'all, guess what? You can now order transcripts of any interview I've done for the incredibly reasonable price of two and a half bucks each. Listen, finding a good transcriptionist is near impossible, but I've got one now. Just go to scotthorton.org slash transcripts, enter the name and date of the interview you want written up, click the PayPal button, and I'll have it in your email in 72 hours max. You don't need a PayPal account to do this. Man, I'm really going to have to learn how to talk more good. That's scotthorton.org slash transcripts. Don't you get sick of the Israel lobby trying to get us into more wars in the Middle East? Or always abusing Palestinians with your tax dollars? It once seemed like the lobby would always have full-spectrum dominance on the foreign policy discussion in D.C. But those days are over. The Council for the National Interest is the America lobby, standing up and pushing back against the Israel lobby's undue influence on Capitol Hill. Go show some support at councilforthenationalinterest.org. That's counselforthenationalinterest.org.